slide share, go ahead and uh, you know uh, connect with me there. Uh, it's usually just through LinkedIn or however they do it. But I, this uh, session will also be recorded if you'd like to use it for any reason, and I'll be pushing it out to uh, Big Virtual Me TV, uh, which is inside the link that I sent you in the chat window at uh, bit.ly slash bvm hyphen tv. And so this, as well as all of, a lot of other content, will all be posted there so that you can, uh, you can check it out and have the chance to use it. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and kind of get started. This is a fairly quick session. Again, you know, the European announcements usually uh, are, are, are much more uh, compressed than the announcements that, that we do inside of the U.S. Um, you know, it's a slightly smaller event. Um, one might consider it, you know, more of an intimate gathering. Um, but there's still a lot of stuff, and I always find that at Europe, what usually ends up happening is the stories that we hear started inside of the U.S. Uh, announcements usually kind of get finished, or they get kind of wrapped up uh, when we go to Europe. Last year was, was no different. We had a lot of new announcements around vSphere 6 and all these other cool things, and then at Europe – we heard about all of the end user compute components. And so I think very much similar to what we're, what we're seeing here. So this is kind of a, a chance to create some cohesion between these announcements so that we have uh, you know, kind of a combined, very uh, contiguous story to tell. So if we start by recapping where we were, and, and I know a lot of you had jumped on uh, for the VMworld 2015 uh, recap that I did uh, with uh, my partner Shang and Tim, and you know uh, we did that during the Top Gun Tech Thursday. It was right after VMworld, so it was obviously lots of fun pulling all that together. But you know we, we talked about some, you know conversational motioning, right? How, you know, inside of VMworld, you know, we really presented this idea of these, you know, these high-level visions. And, you know, that included things like, you know, identity management and, um, uh, you know, it included, uh, you know, application, you know, deployment through things like Project A2. And, you know, we, we talked extensively and people were really blown away by the whole cloud-to-cloud -cloud vMotion. And there was a lot of discussion around, you know, uh, Photon and, you know, the just enough VM and the small footprint and exposing containers to avoid things like, you know, kernel-based attacks that can you know, impact an entire kernel and thus an entire workload in the applications that live inside of those containers. And then one of the things that we did during that conversation is that we – you know, tried to find points of correlation. And, you know, some of the simpler points of correlation, you know, how does this apply? How does this, this high-level vision apply to our SMB and commercial customers today? In, you know, SMB mom-and-pop shops and, and even the commercial customers are not necessarily going to be talking about things like cloud-to-cloud -cloud vMotion and Photon and containerization of applications right out of the gate. But they do need to be able to repair to it and, prepared for it, and we as technical professionals need to be able to communicate the value of these high-level visions and what they're doing today to connect to those high-level visions. So we talked about the changes inside of, uh, you know, Horizon 6.2. We talked about the changes inside of vRealize Ops 6.1. We talked about the new uh, changes and enhancements with NSX 6.2 and the integrations with vSAN 6.1. And then you know, we also introduced you know, some new stuff around Evo and Evo SDDC. And granted, that, that again is a very sophisticated technology, but if you look at all of these at the bottom, these are really kind of foundational building blocks, and the only thing that could conceivably sit below these is really just vSphere, right? So if we see, we're, we're, we're creating sort of this iterative journey. So this is where we were inside of VMworld 2015. Take customers that are sitting in vSphere, how do we motion them into, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Horizon and, and Ops and NSX and vSAN and hyperconvergence and then motion them even further into identity management, application deployment advances, cloud-to-cloud -cloud vMotion and containerization. So that's, at least for me, that's the way I kind of see 
this, uh, this picture progressing. So in Europe, what we did was we added another layer of abstraction. And inside of this space, we're really putting the focus on automation and biz ops. And this is in, uh, coming to us through vRealize Automation and vRealize Business, which was formerly known as ITBM. And so vRealize Automation and vRealize Business are both getting ratcheted up. This is a major version for them. Um, you know, a lot of the other stuff below, right? Horizon, um, Ops, NSX, these were all dot releases. So we're talking feature or fix, we're talking points of integration, but inside of automation and biz ops uh, for vRealize Business, these are major releases. These are both getting ratcheted up to 7.0. So what are these doing? These are really attaching us back to this picture of, you know, the whole ready for any, which I think that, you know, if I, if I kind of look back at that statement, and if I had thought about it the way that I'm thinking about it now when I first heard it, I probably wouldn't have wrestled with it with the logic quite so much. Um, it's really just ready for all, and any equals all. And I think I had that conversation with somebody on, on this call while we were out at VMworld. But it, it's, it's saying, you know, any could be fine, you know, um, on-premise, off-premise. It could be two different clouds. It could be, you know, end-user compute and DAS and on-prem. Just basically anything you want to throw at it, that's the any, right? And so inside of this space, the one thing that is critical is the cloud management platform. So, you know, today we're not going to really be getting into, you know, operations too much because we talked about that. And actually, I sent you guys, uh, sent out a video, and it's on the playlist here with this video as well on, on uh, Big Virtual Me TV on YouTube that uh, goes over some of the technical highlights for vRealize Ops 6.1, including the custom data centers and all of these new cool things that we can do with, uh, with you know, stretch clustering, stretch cluster management and all of that. But today we're going to put our focus and attention around, like I said, the automation and the business ops or vRealize business, because without those, we really have kind of a fragmented story. We've got, you know, hybrid cloud, we've got virtual infrastructure, compute, network storage, and physical attachments, and then we're going, you know, we're kind of jumping right into applications and end user computing, and we're not seeing a way to provide extensibility. And it's through ops automation that we're able to provide these senses of extensibility. And this takes us into this kind of grander platform picture where we can look at being able to, to service cost, agility, and optimization through all of these. You know, cost through business. After all, you know, if we, um, uh, you know, when we're talking to customers, it's, it's really great to be able to say, oh, hey, you know, this is how much your infrastructure is being consumed, and this is how long that's going to go on for, and this is when you're probably going to need to buy stuff. But unless you can apply some sort of biz ops rationalization to that, to say, you know, if you did this, this would impact it in this way, then really all you've got is a bunch of anecdotal information. I mean, yeah, you can act on it, but you don't know how to act on it. You don't know what your options are. The same is true for cloud platforms. People pick up a line card or, or a rate card with a cloud platform provider, and it says you're going to consume these resources at this rate, and then if you consume too much, you're going to have this surcharge. But how do you know what happens if you reswizzle your workloads and do something different with it? This is where vRealize Business kicks in and allows us to service cost. And then we service agility through automation, the ability to scale and, ha and to be able to deploy entire data centers with one button click. So with that, let's start talking about automation first. So automation updates inside of vRealize Automation 7. So again, this is, a, this is a major release. So previously, if you, know, you were familiar and if you've ever done a deployment for vRealize Automation, the one thing you would know is in version 6, it was not intuitive. Right? It, it was, uh, I remember declaring my major for cloud automation, and I went to my first boot camp like a year or so ago, and we went through and deployed vRealize uh, automation, I think it was 6.1. Uh, and, you know, I walked out, you know, and, and got in my car, you know, after that week, and I was like, man, what did I sign up for? You know, because it, it was, you know, okay, you got to unwind, you got to release these bindings from this server, and, and, I mean, it was a thing, man. And so, consequently, things like proof of concept, 
you know, ease of deployment, having somebody just grab the technology and take a look at it was a little bit harder to do than we would really want. And so we're seeing a huge change as we move towards seven. You know, for one, orchestration, right? The, the, the V-Realize orchestration appliances and those components, those have now been integrated into automation. So those have now been pulled into the automation appliance. The reason we're doing that is because orchestration and application integration really needs to be inherent to the automation story. Because after all, how, how often do you deploy a system workload and you don't deploy an application in it, right? It's just a, you know, a dummy workload sitting there. That never happens. <laughs> you, know, you deploy something so that it can run something. That's its whole reason for being. Another thing was you know, data store appliances. Right, and the, these are the, the appliances and the spaces where you know, like the, the dem workers are going to be assigned, and so with those, those have also been migrated inside of the appliance. And you'll see here we have two appliances. That's because what we're showing you is the difference in you know, what redundancy looks like. So what we're building out is, is something redundant. And then, lastly, we had uh, the need for an identity appliance. So you had to deploy an identity appliance, and you had you know, a hot and a cold identity appliance sitting there. And so we've even done away with that. So now all of the identity management for vRealize automation is resident inside of the appliance. So from an architectural perspective, we've gone from this vision of having multiple machines to you know, having the appliance, and then you're going to run out, and this appliance will be the bit, sorry, this appliance will be the bit that will connect out to the IaaS server, and then the IaaS server is what connects us to vCenter to actually make the calls to build out the machinery. So you can see how this is really streamlined things, because before, when we had all of these bits living just inside of the automation space, we had lots of issues regarding, you know, NTP, time sync, resolution, FQDN uh, resolves for the different machines, and it got very, very sticky. But now this should make proof of concept a lot easier. And then in addition, we have also provided for an automated wizard-based deployment. So basically what happens is all of the Windows components, all of the logging, um, all of the VRA pieces, whether you say, hey, you know what, I'm just doing a little minimal deployment, proof of concept, kind of pokey puppy, getting people started, or maybe I'm doing like an enterprise deployment where, you know, inside of the enterprise space, you can see here how it's diagrammed out. It lets you say, okay, well, how many, you know, vRealize appliances, how many IaaS web servers. So really, you can just take the white papers for scale and say, okay, well, if I'm doing this many machines, this is how much I need. And you just click the drop-down box and say you need this many. And it's even going to give you like that little outline of architecture over there, which I think is just kind of more of a static idea. And then you can assign the server roles that you need to the servers that are being deployed. Whether, you know, it's if you're, again, if you're talking enterprise class, whether you're doing, you know, proxy servers, you know, which servers are going to create the, um, uh, the dem workers and, and all of that. But for your basic minimal deployments, it's really just a radio box, and then all of this becomes a moot point. And again, like I mentioned, getting rid of the, uh, the additional identity manager or the identity appliance, so we don't have to integrate that identity appliance anymore. Um, we don't have a separate virtual appliance. It's embedded right inside of VRA, so the VRA contains the auth, the, the auth services, because before we had it sitting externally and then we'd have to point Active Directory at it. So now once the appliance is joined to Active Directory, then you should have a pretty clear shot to open up a tenant and drop in a uh, authentication store so that you can deal with all of your Auth-Z and Auth-N work right inside, of, uh, right inside of automation. And it also has some new um, some new enablement uh, capabilities, right? Um, full out-of-the-box branding. Before this was, I mean, it wasn't hard, but it was still you had to crack open a cascading style sheet, a CSS, and you have to you have to uh, twist that around. And we also didn't have uh, 
you know, support for like multi-factor, you know, authentication and, and smart cards and all of that. And now that's being baked in here. And we can also apply multiple domains to a single tenant. This would be a great use case if someone says, hey, you know what, I want to, you know, be able to kind of subdivide what I'm getting out of vRealize automation into, you know, kind of multiple subtenants or, or give people multiple, you know, points of domain access. That'd be one way you could do that. You can also go the other way and provide, you know, a single domain to multiple tenants. So this, I think, gives us a lot more flexibility in the way people are going to use the, uh, use the technology. This I am crazy excited about. Anyone who ever saw me demonstrate vRealize Automation saw me create blueprints. One of the things I always did because it's like, hey, you know, you need to see how you create machines. And the blueprinting process was really very dialogue-based. It was select your machine, select your, uh, uh, you know, your snapshot, select, how, you know, uh, how this machine's behave, put in how much it's supposed to cost, and it was very dialogue-based. And multi-machine blueprints were really no better. It was you got to create some single machine blueprints, and then you got to slap them into the multi-machine, you know, blueprint, and you know, give them all names and try to remember which one's which. Now we have a design canvas. So this unified blueprint design canvas allows us to drop in machines, infrastructure, network, security, even um, orchestration. So if you have, uh, like, orchestration, a great example would be one that's, that's given here, where we've got um, software license verification as an orchestration action that exists inside of this space. So you can deploy an actual uh, server, and then you can also deploy the application that lives on that server so that it plays with the others, and then also create dependencies between these points so that, you know, once this gets deployed and loaded, it will go ahead and it will check for software license verification. And all of this, again, is done with one click. But it gets even cooler because we can also support nested multi-machine blueprints. So now you're looking at this blueprint and you're saying, well, that's really great, you know, but I've got to deploy this machine and this machine and, and yeah, you know, I've, I've got this machine connecting to this network segment and, you know, this machine's connecting out to this network segment and, and all of these cool things. But what if I've got like, you know, a, a three-tiered app that's already there that needs to feed this? Well, that's not a problem anymore. You can actually drag on an entire other multi-machine blueprint and that multi-machine blueprint with its own, uh, you know, with its own networking, with its own, you know, segmentation and dependencies and everything else it's got, and then you can create dependencies and workflows into, you know, these other systems and applications. And yes, you can orchestrate the start and stop order of machines just using the those dependency clicks. So without having to, you know, orchestrate it in, uh, you know, and have to write down notes of which machine's starting first, you can actually just build it on this canvas. Now, the only time this is going to be evident is when you're building machinery. But what's even cooler is that this will also be uh, an exportable file, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, too. So one of the big deals, and I think when we're communicating this out to customers and we're doing demos and talking about it, is that we have to, again, make sure that it's relevant to them. So one of, the, one of the ways I think is easy to communicate this is to say, okay, well, why does this matter? So this matters because we're moving away, and we have moved away from a paradigm where we had these monolithic, uh, you know, data ideas, right? We had server, storage, compute, you know, uh, uh, network, and, and, you know, it's just, you know, bottom to top. That's how we did it. And we've moved into a space where this is kind of more what we think about when we think about virtual data centers. We've got, uh, you know, software-defined networking, software-defined storage. We've got compute. We've got, you know, some automation or some scripting. Maybe even it's just, you know, host profiles, whatever. Hell, that could even just be uh, cloning, right, snapshotting, some, some very pedestrian thing that we do now that, you know, 10 years ago was crazy exotic, right? And then we're, we've become more comfortable with the ideas of edge security for, you know, these, these workloads and, and these types of placement. But now we're kind of zooming out as we look into, like, cloud scale, and these types of things are becoming much smaller. 
And we're finding the need to take these and to be able to replicate them at significant scale. And to be able to do so without worrying about the security of the individual machine, right? Because we're zooming out and we're, we're not able to see what's going on inside of every single one of those little workloads all the time without having to worry about running out of VLANs, right? If we're, if we're you know, only given you know, uh, you know, 4094 to play with, it's pretty you know, quick to see how fast we can run out of those. So how do we integrate things like NSX? How do we integrate things like you know, forms of automation and making sure that all this is secure? How do we make sure that we're not dealing with you know, layer two broadcast collisions because you know, all of these different workloads are using the same IPs? And these are the kind of scale issues that customers, they might not be talking about a thousand different uh, individual data centers at once, but they're certainly going to maybe be talking about eh, maybe a dozen at least if they're getting into this space where they're talking about automating stuff, even if nothing more than just inside of development environments or inside of the tendency they have within their own departments and geos, right? So then we look at simplification of this process. You can see I took the, the, those microcosms, I dropped a couple in here, and let's say those represented like multi-machine blueprints or existing workloads. And now with vRealize 7, we can now attach those existing workloads and nest them alongside other individual workloads, individual VMs, and attach things like load balancing, firewalling, switching, and routing so that we can apply some layer of simplicity and replication and still provide security between these points so that we can scale it out as big and as crazy as we want. And a lot of this comes to us courtesy of this idea of the unified blueprint. This is going to make architecting and designing this stuff so much easier. And like I said, it's not just machines anymore. It's also network services and security services and also you know, the XAAS. So anything that you can build inside of Orchestrator is also within this. So you don't have to just be limited by just saying, oh, I gotta put out a machine and then somebody's gotta go deploy the code into the machine. I mentioned that NSX is getting integrated. Uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the deeper points of NSX integration, but really we're now able to provide micro-segmentation, not just at the, the, the system, but now down to you know, the application level. And this also extends to you know, conversations about what we're doing with AirWatch and VPN level micro-segmentation. There's, there's a lot that's happening with micro-segmentation beyond just you know, the, the distributed firewall you know, um, uh, living out you know, right at the NIC. And while you know, for a lot of us, that is still you know, just such a, such a new and cool concept, it's amazing to think how fast this is growing and what we're capable of doing every single day. We're also providing new lifecycle extensibility. And what this really means, what it distills down to, is you can now have blueprints that span clouds so that you, you can actually create a blueprint that can, that can deploy uh, you know, on virtual resources, physical resources, and multiple different cloud platforms all, at, all within one deployment stroke. So you don't have to have, this is a cloud blueprint, this is an on-prem blueprint, uh, this is a physical blueprint. Everything can be deployed and it can be intermingled. And that's because we're seeing this new level of kind of uh, first class uh, endpoint, which is, is also something that we're you know, introducing within vCloud. So really this extensibility just makes things more, well, I guess for lack of better words, the way they should be. The blueprints become code. I told you you could export these. Um, there's going to be a community. It's continuing to spring up. It's already alive. And all these blueprints can be exported as YAML code. And all that YAML can be imported by a client. And consequently, clients can do the same thing. They can contribute to it. So this is all totally interoperable with the vRealize automation user interface. And they can also do imports, exports into different tenants or different instances of VRA. So they can get things from the community or they can design their own stuff and they can create all sorts of neat ways to, uh, uh, you know, to communicate their, their blueprints out there. 
Before version 7, we had some functionality that existed between NSX and automation. Really that functionality, if you kind of scratched in at it, it was really more about VXLAN and, you know, about the, uh, you know, packet encapsulation. And that's what was happening, so that we could have multiple, uh, you know, IP layer 2 segments running next to each other. But beyond just placing machines on those segments, it, it really didn't go a lot further than that. But in version 7, we're now seeing, you know, you know increased functionality for uh, switches, so that you can now have virtual switches included inside of you know, blueprints and, and workloads, as well as routing, firewalling, and logical load balancing. So basically, it's full NSX integration inside of automation. So anything that you could imagine you could do with a physical data center, you can now do inside of a blueprint, and it will all get deployed in time. I mentioned the uh, improvements around, you know, first class endpoints. So before you had to have the endpoint URL, and then you had to have the, the, uh, uh, you know, the tenant identification, all this stuff. And you had to go, you know, back and forth between, you know, vCloud and automation, and and you know, uh, EC2 and automation, and Azure and automation to try to get all this figured out. Now we have the the first class endpoint, so you can just drop in the URL. And then it will figure out the abstraction. It'll tell you what resources are available. And at that point, you can just effectively sort of claim those resources and march forward with your deployment. We also have some enhanced management for approvals. And because I figured this was more of a technical crowd, I wanted to include this. Uh, basically, now we can dynamically assign approvals and we can see, you know, which approvals have gone stale. We can attach approvals to software components or machine components. Again, think back to those blueprints. And we can trigger them for new reasons. And we can also, uh, you know, create triggers to say, well, again, if we have someone who would have done the approval, now we can automatically assign approvals to, you know, whomever, you know, their manager is. And we're doing this because we're integrating more tightly with the, uh, with the authentication stores that live inside of the customer's environment. So basically, if, you know, uh, if Bob starts a new job and, and you know, he uh, you know, is there and he's reporting to, to, to Ken, then you know, he, every time he requests a machine, it's going to bubble it up to Ken and Ken's going to have to approve it. But then when Bob moves over and he starts reporting to Mary, then you don't have to do anything inside of the blueprint. All of his approvals will follow him, and now everything he does has to be approved by Mary. So this means that we can kind of take that set it and forget it, do it once, and don't ever have to do it again approach to the way we're building out the approval processes and things. So moving right along, um, talking about vRealize business and, and business intelligence and biz ops inside of this space. One of the big things is we've really enhanced what vRealize Business looks like. We made some changes to the PPNL, and we're making it more of a uh, more of a first-class citizen inside of the suites because it really does make sense, and there's a lot of points of clear integration for it. We now have the ability to do automatic cost and consumption across clouds, and so that. There, before, they could see between the clouds, right? They could see, okay, well, this is on-premise, so this is what it would happen if I took that workload and put it off-premise, or I put it to this cloud or that cloud, um, and they could do a comparison, but they couldn't really do like a consumption aggregation and say, what am I spending across all of my clouds? What am I spending on-prem and off-prem? And how is this forecasted on-prem and off-prem? And how can I double-click into those projections? So this is really new um, inside of vRealize Business, the ability to create these aggregations and to get a little more uh, you know, quality of data granularity inside of this space. They can also get into costs and drivers. So now they can, they can see fully loaded costs of uh, you know, storage and then you know, break it all the way down into hardware, storage, demand, labor, facilities, maintenance. They can do the same thing for compute, network. And 
if, even if they're going with NSX or vSAN, it doesn't mean they're going to lose visibility. Because before, the Realize Business was very much contingent upon, okay, well, these are your physical resources, this is how you're consuming them, this is your networking, your storage. But if they were using something like Virtual SAN or NSX, then they would lose visibility into it. But now NSX and vSAN are both integrated and they make themselves visible to the realized business. So regardless of their networking and storage compute platforms, they're going to have line of sight into it from a forecasting and prediction perspective. We also have faster time to value. So what this basically means is that the realized business is going to be able to auto-generate uh, pricing for private cloud. And they're going to be able to download this right from, right from my VMware. And it'll auto-generate pricing based upon what it sees in the environment. But you can always override it. But at least it lets them kind of, you know, uh, you know, light the fire and get some real time to value return out of this out of this platform. In addition, you know, they can take, uh, you know, the auto generated policies that they have for, you know, AWS, and they can even apply, you know, surcharges or things that might uh, be incurred. And all of this is being cycled back into the policies that live inside of vRealize Automation. So what's going on inside of automation is that business will now be the foundational driver for populating all of these rate cards. So before, you would have to take what came out of business and you would have to export it, import it into VRA, and uh, you know, again, it, it would work, but it wasn't quite as elegant as it is as it's becoming. And so now, since the realized business is just an appliance that you point and it becomes, you know, a tab, you know, inside of VRA, and that's actually what the tab is going to look like right there, then, you know, it's able to populate this content directly in. So what does this mean that we can do? Well, I think it's pretty exciting because imagine this. Imagine you've got a CFO who's you know, updating depreciation, amortization, and, and cost for uh, server and storage uh, resources. And he's updating that, and he's making these uh, changes and enhancements inside of something like SAP or SAP HANA. Then we can integrate those databases back into vRealize Business. vRealize Business can create the, uh, the forecast and analysis for those resources. And then when Bob goes to request his resources that Mary's going to approve, it's going to show him how much those resources are going to cost. And these can be updated in real time according to the line of sight and uh, the, the acumen that, that, the, that the CFOs and the financial officers are bringing to the table. They don't have to do it like that. They can also keep it very, uh, very streamlined as well, but this kind of gives them kind of a, a quick way to, to run through it. We also have uh, increased show back to line of business, so if they want to create aggregates, they can do that too, so that uh, you know, they don't have to worry with you know, how they're going to you know, speak to different lines of business inside of the space. They can aggregate what they're using and what they're forecasting use for. And then we're giving sort of bicameral support through automation so that the people that are uh, managing these resources can see how they're being consumed, not necessarily what they're costing, but how they're being consumed so that they can make the right decisions from an infrastructure perspective. And then I kind of threw this in, this is just for fun, is that we also have, uh, you know, they'll also have access to a vRealize Business iPad app that will allow them to see some cool visualizations of what's going on inside of their environment. So VRB is available a um, couple different ways. You mean you got standard with your, you know, quick time to value, uh, you know, basically just takes the data that it's seeing from automation and vCenter, and it reswizzles it and turns it into something that is, uh, you know, manageable and forecastable, and in advance they can pull from any data source. And like I said, some popular ones would be things like SAP or SAP HANA, and it can integrate SA, uh, as a SaaS offering or on-prem. It, of course, includes all the standard stuff. It's easy for people to get started with it. You know, if you have customers that are looking at this, you know, they've got the automation starter kit or the cloud management starter kit. And the only big difference is the cloud management starter kit includes um, the Realize Business 
and it also includes vRealize Ops Advanced. So they have operations, automation, and business all tied together. With the Automation Starter Kit, it's just automation and business. And then we've got professional services kits and SKUs already designed around this, including a you know advanced design and deploy core for the, the whole management thing, which will give them pretty much all the information they need. Really, with the additions, like I said, um, vRealize Business is also available as a standalone and advanced in enterprise, or it's part of the, the uh, vCloud and vRealize suites inside of these additions. So really, we're talking to our customers about vRealize. It's about kind of moving them from you know, where they're crawling and they're just looking for like cloud costing into where they're looking for showback and being able to report this into lines of business, all the way until they're able to see you know, holistic uh, costing for their entire financial services center and integrating with things like SAP and getting vision into their entire IT spend and how that's being projected out. So really, this is a tool that can grow with them in a lot of different ways. Now, for, to wrap up, just some quick uh, peripheral announcements that we made in Europe. One was the integration of Google DNS into vCloud Air, so basically allowing companies that are you know, doing email, web, e-commerce hosting, whatever they're up to, and to be able to integrate with Google DNS so that they can you know, make more streamlined uh, ways of communicating and getting people you know, routed, to their, uh, routed to their sites. We also announced for our service providers out there vCloud Director 8, which has support for vSphere 6, uh, tenant throttling so that they can proactively adjust what the SLAs are going to look like for their tenants, as well as being able to import, export uh, machine blueprints from vRealize Automation into vCloud Director so that if they're using both tools, depending upon how they're leveraging them, they can still uh, take advantage of the blueprints and the YAML-based export and authoring. And then we also announced uh, vSphere integrated containers on vCloud Air, which effectively is giving access to the Photon platform so they can use you know, the just enough VM where with the instant cloning and the Photon OS and be able to leverage this with all of the same things that are inside of vSphere like DRS, vMotion, HADR, as well as advanced networking services so that they can protect their containers. Uh, like I said, check the... Um, you know, check this, uh, the playlist. There will be a video coming out uh, called NSX uh, Nine Core Use Cases, I believe, that I filmed and, and we'll, we'll have for you guys, and it talks about the importance of micro-segmentation in a container, uh, containerized environment. And then uh, the last thing we announced was Project Michigan. Project Michigan really kind of helps deliver on that cloud-to-cloud -cloud vision, and this is a tech preview. So what it really does is it allows you to deploy an enterprise gateway across vCloud Air offerings, whether it's on-demand, dedicated, or even DR to the cloud. And it supports virtual machine migrations, as well as network policy extensions. Now, you don't have to have NSX on-prem to use it, but if you do, you can extend those network policies directly out into the cloud so as machines are moving back and forth, their network policies go with them. And this integrates directly with Hybrid Cloud Manager to keep it nice and simple, and that just snaps right into um, to the vSphere web client so that you can move machines back and forth without having to power them off. And like I said, this, this kind of you know, completes the vision uh, for the cloud-to-cloud -cloud vMotion, which I think we talk about that and the long distance that we did in vSphere 6 and you know, being able to synchronize catalogs and stretch clusters for, uh, uh, you know, for vSAN and all of this. It, it really all starts to kind of make sense. So with that, I'll leave you with some, with some links and some asks. Uh, like I said, you know, watch your emails, social media for further you know, enablement announcements. I've got probably about six or seven videos that are being added to the playlist uh, here within the next few weeks. Uh, there's, I think, one new one that went out last night on vRealize Op 6.1's technical overview there. Got stuff around NSX, vSAN, uh, as well as uh, some stuff around the unified hybrid cloud story and being able to communicate that as effectively as we can. You can also check uh, aponewsletter.blogspot.com to read the, uh, the updated blog that we curate. 
And also, if you use Flipboard on any of your devices, uh, you can either search for Kay Grote and follow the magazines that I publish there, or you can look specifically for this link, APO Tech Mag, and put that into your browser, and it'll open up the magazine for you to subscribe. And also, if you're doing anything regarding EUC, uh, be sure to check out VMW Demo. It gives people a test drive to our entire suite of products. And as always, be, uh, be sure to uh, follow me on Twitter for updates and enhancements. Follow the blogs. Check out the YouTube page at, um, that I put here in the chat window at bit.ly uh, bvm hyphen tv for more. And I'll look forward to talking to you guys soon. And with that, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording so that we can sanitize this.